So for me, that's sort of become the framework, right? Saying, sit back, put your uninterrupted, unqualified thoughts in front. You don't need to be nice to a founder. He's already, he or she has already heard everything bad in the world that they could have, they could have heard. Yeah. Um, a no from an investor saying, I don't believe in your model is like the, like a slap in the face, right? Because they, they're tough creatures. So rather than trying to sort of manage them with kid gloves, like just be honest with them, behave like an honest operator with them, continuously keep showing them what they really need to see. Today we had Dhruv Dhanraj Behel on the podcast. Dhruv is the former COO of Bharat Pay. Before that, he played an important role in helping Paytm scale and is also a prolific operator, angel investor in the Indian tech ecosystem. We covered how did he transition from being a full-time operator to operator investor, what triggered him to start angel investing, how did he get better at angel investing, what helped, his journey of learning to distinguish good deals from bad deals, the important lesson he learned from angel investing, importance of ESOPs, the power of paying it forward, mentors, who is the outsider work, and much more. Now I bring you Dhruv. Dhruv, so good to have you on the pod. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I must say thank you to your wife uh, for the haircut. <laughs> uh, we were just chatting about it uh, a little while ago. <laughs> Yes, good, good. No, everything good in my life is because of her. So the credit goes fairly and squarely there. Looking sharp. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Dhruv, you are an operator and you worked at, you know, one of the best uh, fintech companies in India, uh, Paytm, uh, Bharat Pay, and you have also transitioned into a uh, operator investor. Uh, what was the motivation like? What drove you into angel investing? And you remember your first angel investment? Uh, okay, so so I think uh, you know very interestingly, uh, what happened in my life was that when I started out my career, I actually started out my career at what I call um, my analog startup days, which was six seven years at Fortis Healthcare. I joined them when they were a small setup of five hospitals and. And, you know, they, they were an IPO in the middle. And then, then you know, they, by the time I left, there were 65 hospitals in nine countries. Uh, so I got that really big growth experience. I saw, uh, of course, I never saw venture capital there, but I did see like early stage investors. I saw like them, one of TMSX earliest investments in India and then how that prompted us to behave more like an IPO able company and I IPO. And, and that gave me an experience saying that, look, uh, there is this potential for, creating wealth for yourselves. And, you know, we were employees, we were given options. And this is, you know, 2006, you'd never heard of stock options, you know, in, in the larger world, if you weren't from the Valley, right? Um, but, uh, but you know, Shivinder was really smart. He'd given us stock options and he had promised us certain shares on grant on, on successful IPO. And when we got that, a lot of us suddenly saw corpuses of wealth come out. Now I use that for getting married, I used that for my MBA, and I made certain smart investments uh, in my life, uh, which have really worked out. Uh, but when I, you know, I, after NCR, I did Bain for a couple of years, but when the operator age kicked back, you know, by that time, this is 2016, uh, late 15, early 16, I started seeing the digital world uh, happen. So, you know, my one of my last times was uh, Alibaba, who recommended me to Paytm, and that's how I got there. And you know, that's another story I told you about how reputation follows you around. But a lot of friends um, were there and, and got a great opportunity, a great landing pad, great place to sort of kickstart my operator journey again. Paytm happened. Uh, and as Paytm happened, you know, some of that equity came out within the two years that I was with Paytm. Um, and as that equity came in, we suddenly saw, you know, because you're coming out of MBA debt, you suddenly saw a corpus of money in your bank for the first time. They're like, what do you do? Uh, so my wife and I sat down um, and, uh, you know, we started thinking about what should we do with this money? We don't want this money to influence our lifestyle. Uh, so she said, look, let's put some money away as a nest egg so that we're not worried about our future, always building for the future. Let's secure our future today. So that's what we did. And then I said, okay, it's still a sizable amount. What do we do with the rest of the money? And, you know, that's when, you know, in hindsight, you know, about a year ago, Sunil Sachar at Huddle helped me put it into a framework, but what it wasn't uh, at that point in time was this framework, but it was very similar to it saying capital has various forms. Financial is one form where the money should create money for you and the wealth should work for you. 
and, and sort of continuously secure your future and your aspirations. But capital also is in the form of social capital and intellectual capital. Um, so, uh, you know, you can throw a lot of parties and be very social, but that money is, you know, you know, they're, they're fair weather friends. They're not going to stick around with you after a while. Um, and uh, you could go do another course, but you'll get a limited education through intellectual capital. So how do you make sure that you get a very broad spectrum um, sort of ROA on your investment? Um, and that's uh, that's really when, uh, you know, we started thinking about it as social and intellectual capital, uh, which was access to great people and access to things or or situations or problems um, or models and businesses that will teach us about either a new space, uh, 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 a new uh, way of solving a problem, or maybe a new technology or, or some new paradigm in the industry. And that's really how we started looking at it. And th with that philosophy is how, you know, we, had, we created the small family trust and we started investing into startups. So my first actual check that I committed was actually three companies. Um, and I committed the entire corpus to three companies because in the early days, you don't know how to write checks. So you just say, oh my God, this is amazing. And you get, you get sort of swept with the tide. Um, and I wrote three, um, you know, at that point, I'm slightly sizable checks, which I shouldn't have written retrospectively. One of the companies I got my money plus some inflation adjusted money back in about two years. Uh, and this is 2017. One of the companies folded. I lost all that money. And the third company actually helped me look under the hood. Um, and that company ended up becoming my next employer. So around that time, I just got head on into uh, Airtel Payments Bank. I'd gone in to set up the Airtel Payments Bank um, for, what, you know, for Airtel, one of India's largest telcos. And, you know, somehow it wasn't a great fit for me at that point. Maybe I wasn't right for them. They weren't right for me. I don't know what was it. But having this access to look under different companies gave me this option saying, hey, I'm... A, I, I'm a decently good builder and operator. Maybe I should, you know, hone my skills in the sort of one to 10 stage um, on proven models or proven product market fits. Um, and that's when I started looking at Rhodes and, and I ended up working for Rhodes and for the next two and a half years as their CBO growing revenue for them. So, so that mm -hmm. was my first investment. Got it. So, you know, you got some liquidity uh, and uh, your friend Sanel uh, helped you build the frame. Uh, framework and so Dhruv, when you initially started mm -hmm. uh did you learn like were you listening to podcasts books or you had mentors where they were helping you uh become a, a better investor you know what interestingly no i'll tell you what where my um where sort of my philosophical journey of wanting access to sort of fine you know various forms of capital actually became more of a practical journey is when i actually ended up joining bharat pay in 2019 and early 2020 um you know at that point in time sort of ashneer who was the then ceo of the was already a sort of a prolific angel um there were you were you know this pre covid the first four five months before covid we were beginning to see people break out and do startups. So we had, you know, fashions are come out, then we had, you know, a couple of youngsters leave and join venture studios and incubators. Uh, so we were seeing the early signs of, you know, the, the Bharat Pay Mafia uh, happen. Um, so some of those people, you know, are, are to whom I wrote checks over, over the, over a period of time, but uh, it really sort of started coming together when like two or three people actually, you know, took a step up and said, we think you're great at this. We think you're, you're a, you're an operator who brings significant more value, uh, to an investment than just the capital that you bring to the table. And here's how you sort of mold yourself a little better. This is how you, uh, practice the art. So it was Sohail Samir, who was the, who they had just joined as this, uh, president of the company and was going to soon become the CEO of the company. Um, uh, he. Uh, you know, he was there. Then there was another friend of dear friend, Tarana Lalwani at Innoven Capital. We'd been doing some deals with Innoven, picking up debt from them. And Tarana started, you know, sort of talking to me about, you know, oh, you you have this very sharp, clear mind and, you know, you should help some of the early guys also, you know, leapfrog um, with your knowledge. She introduced me to uh, a couple of good friends, um, Rohan and Arjun at Good Capital. 
uh, in 2020 and and you know the rest is sort of history like it uh, you know these are some of the people who were and then of course Nikhil Bandarkar who's an NCR classmate of mine who's also a prolific angel runs Panthera Peak so there I think if I had to credit like four people who have pushed me into sort of this might just be a spike in your in, in your you know personality or in your in your repertoire and pursue it was them and and somewhere I think it was just about getting you know asking stupid questions in a safe space in the first sort of six months um you know SSA or SHA mein difference kya hota hai? um you know how do you get um uh, you know uh, how, how do you look at a convertible when is a convertible a good thing to do not to do um you know what does a what does a you know um, follow through mean and and what does it, what, what's the difference between an RUV and 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 any other vehicle? So there was like very random questions that I used to ask in the early days, which I didn't know, right? Um, and that sort of got me going of writing small checks. So my couple of my first were like really small checks, and as I started doing that, I started seeing that I was able to sort between good companies and great companies uh, with a certain degree of conviction. And that's when I sort of increased some of my checks and I actually end up writing some of the checks which today have ended up being, you know, uh, sort of corpus returners for me and, and uh, have sort of made this whole journey um, risk free to some degree. Um, but, but, but that's that happened. But, but you know, uh, I think you don't know as well as some other people do, at least in this industry, uh, because people see you from the outside and then you'll have founders say, you know, that's one of the best investor meetings I've had. Um, you know, there was no gyan. There was only sort of actionable stuff. We really got into it. Or you'll realize that your go-to friend actually becomes a, a, a co-investor or a friend with whom you're catching up to talk about industry stuff and not not just, you know, sort of bitch and moan about what's wrong in life or, or let's just have a drink and, and not talk shop. Those things are also fine. But you're talking, you're talking industry shop um, and not specific problem shop. And, and I think that when you build that sort of network, uh, you know, you start uh, appreciating. And, and over time, I've actually become friends with people who I only see during, you know, when, we, when we're co-investing in deals. But they've become really good friends now. I mean, you're an example of that, right? You're, you're an example of that. You're, um, you know, Rahul Chaudhary at Matrix is an example of that, uh, ex Tebow founder. Uh, people I now call friends very confidently, um, you know, even though all we do is we talk about startups and that's a shared passion. And, and then that's where the friendship has come out of. So, so yeah, that's been my journey. Got it. So looks like, you know, your real journey started uh, from Bharat Pay. And I think it's very natural when co-workers, colleagues, they leave, uh, they'll come to you for your advice and capital. And then along the way, a few of your friends, you know, they could spot uh, that uh, this is something, this could be something for you. Yeah. And, and and they were able to learn that, you know, from founders as well. They were talking about you yeah. and, and you were just curious. You were just, uh, you know, following that framework. And one of the things I really uh, loved uh, about you, Dhruv, is, you know, they say that uh, move from uh, being a deal friend to real friends as soon as possible and seems like you know this is what you've been doing just uh, i think it's more of like a you know natural uh, extension of who you are yeah. and Dhruv, you you said now uh, i think you've been investing for a few years you've done a bunch of investments a lot of learnings i'm sure a lot of mistakes there as well and you said you were able to you know after some time you were able to spot from the good deals versus bad deals maybe you could double click on that uh, what was the journey like so I think the, the early journey was actually a lot of listening, right? Just, um, you know, as an operator, you, you know, we have to optimize for time um, in a resource constrained environment. So why are you successful or why are you paid the big bucks or the, or the higher ESOP allocation is because you walk into a room, you listen to, uh, you know, a bunch of information being said uh, from people who may be actually on the ground building it and you're able to build sort of the, 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 the framework or connect the dots much faster and you're able to take, you know, a risk weighted bet faster, right? That's what is expected of you. Now, when you 
shift to a because you're in the business as well you're you're day to day you're running the business when you shift to an uh, sort of a uh, what i call so that's the owner operator model then there is the angel operator model right uh, when you become the angel operator your first you have to first become the angel then you become the operator advisor right so you have to first get in there and listen so for the early days for me was a lot of listening to what are you building how are you building it what are, what industry are you looking at what are you disrupting and something that stuck with me uh, beautifully is uh, there's a framework that charlie munger talks about it's called lattice lattice works so he basically says if you look at all the industries as a lattice and you look at all functional applications as a cross at some point in time you can pick up a best practice from here and plug it into another industry because that function may cross section with another industry as well um so so i think very fast if you're able to figure out look uh, your industry is x it works like this this is what a filtration rate looks like this is what's working this is what's not working for you if it's customer awareness which is not working for you maybe you need to implement refer and earn as a program because that works really well in industries where um, you know differentiation between brand a and brand b is very difficult so let the, let people talk about it and let them find their own cohorts by themselves um if there is a if there is an industry where like if you're trying to sort of you know do trade marketing you need to change trade marketing cacs because in fmcg every store is cm1 positive every store when you leave a product there you get some cash out of it but in fintech or telco when you go and leave a certain number of products at a store you don't know whether that store is actually going to yield uh profitability back it's are you going to make the margin or the money back so how do you change the framework um you, you get inspired but you change it in a in a very different way um it's very easy for zomato workers to do big gig economy workers but if you want to go sell a home loan can you sell can do you need an employee who's actually spent three months training learning the context can sound knowledgeable so when when i made the investment in basic home loans uh you know a lot of what the founder was able to catch that sort of observation of mine and a few months later come back and said hey i i got that and look we've built this education and automation module which within 6 hours makes a guy as smart as anyone who's 3 months in the system so i don't need to take liability of hiring people anymore i can make people work on success free so uh, so i think a, a lot of it for me was and even today is when i when i right is actually sitting back and being a great sounding board and letting the socratic method of thought take over so you just like hey why do you think of it like this that's a great idea have you thought of it like this and you'll start seeing great models or great models and great founders actually are able to do that lattice work connection much faster and then you realize that there is a certain degree of resilient thinking lateral thinking um you know sort of uh, in some degree like problem solving first principle mindset that exists right um which which moves you really fast into uh you know action and that is really what differentiates so for me that sort of become the framework right saying sit back put your you know uninterrupted um unqualified thoughts in front you don't need to be nice to a founder he's already he or she has already heard everything bad in the world that they could have they could have heard um a no from an investor saying i don't believe in your model is like the like a slap in the face right because you believe, fundamentally that's your baby you believe in everything so so they they're tough creatures so so rather than trying to sort of manage them with kid gloves like just be honest with them behave like an behave like an honest operator with them uh, show them the mirror learn from them adapt that mirror continuously keep showing them what they really need to see and you'll see that the better ones pick that pick those signals up much faster got it and uh, dhruv uh, you know for founders uh, if they're listening you know what kind of check sizes do you write uh, what sectors do you invest in uh, or any uh, industries that you're focused on or your uh, industry uh, agnostic so uh, so our family fund is industry agnostic early stage c2 pre series a um our average check size uh, in a personal capacity is between 
fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars, roughly around. If I did the math, it's around what uh, between sort of twelve lakhs to twenty lakh odd checks is what we do. Um, there is also uh, I do co invest with a with a bunch of uh, super angels and uh, early stage investors. So more often than not, if I am taking the deal into into my network or if I'm getting the deal from my network, I usually attach on. But if I'm taking the deal into my network, it's usually like then first access gets uh, people out um, into a larger sort of setup. Got it. And uh, Dhruv, uh, you know, if you were to pick one uh, biggest learning or I would say, in other words, uh, something you know now about angel investing, you wish you knew earlier when you had just started. I think, you know, it's, it's the, it's the ability to say no. Like I genuinely wish I knew how to say no, uh, in a smarter and a more legible way. Um, you know, I have about 50 odd angel investments today. Um, out of those 50, um, I can tell you that luck has favored me and those that I did not want to do somehow just did not work out. But there were a couple of places where just because I wasn't able to say no, my check size is a little more is a little bigger than what I was comfortable with for that stage of a company. Now, fortunately, that bet has also worked out and, and I'm not taking names, but some of those companies have grown into their sort of expectations from me. Uh, but but I think you know, when you're sitting in front of a highly convicted individual who has given up everything in their life to build this one thing for the next, you know, X number of years of their life and, and in their head, see every founder builds thinking I'm going to be a unicorn. I'm going to be a, you know, um, unicorn revenue that some of the really aggressive ones think I'm going to be a unicorn revenue company. Right. Um, and, uh, that's great for that moment when the brouhaha is happening. But when you sort of, you know, simmer down, something that I always end up doing is I end up taking like, uh, so just a pause. I, I, I should learn to say no. I did not know how to say no. I, the way I learned it over a period of time, and this is something that a, that a dear friend at work actually taught me who does a few co-investments with me. He said, why don't you just ask them how they'll get to a hundred crore ARR? And he says, and actually that's the most insightful question that we now ask every single angel investment saying, okay, hundred crores divided by 12 is 8.33 crores. What's your ATS? That's your eight divide your whatever ticket, assuming you cannot influence ticket size and you have thought of a competitive pricing, keeping price elasticity in mind, divide that by whatever your price point is. Let's say it's a, it's a hundred rupee price point. That means you need to get 8.3 lakh consumers every month. Uh, is there even a market of that size in your product, right? Uh, who does 8.3 lakhs today? Uh, and you know, and then the guy says, Oh no, I, I'll make it 200 because it's four lakh is the market. And I'm like, okay, then, then you've changed the price point conversation. There's your product, uh, expect the price point. So it's a very, it's a very powerful question because the minute you throw it out, um, you know, the cats out of the bag and then suddenly you'll start seeing that person's mind also fitting things into that framework, trying to roll back and say, and then the next question is, okay, then, okay, you've been able to convince me that you can get to hundred crores. How many years do you fit my, do you fit my, uh, fund horizon? Do you fit my sort of in, investing sort of ability? And, uh, you know, it's also taught me to change some of the things like right? when, when, you know, when my family's now applied for an AIF license, We've actually taken a 25 year horizon on, on, on angel bets, because we don't ever want to ask people saying, Kitne saal mein the idea is that's a very uncomfortable question. Right. And I think it's an unfair question. Sometimes the market needs to grow. Some things need to grow by with themselves. So, so we've also eliminated some of the things we've learned, but, uh, but yes, uh, being able to push them towards realizing something, which might be the reason for you to say no to a deal. Um, organically uh, is a skill that I wish I had learned. Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't mean I won't ask hard questions even today um, as an investor, but uh, it just means that I make them more 
self sustaining to be to at least think through some of the future pitfalls be future proof future ready um and 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 that makes my job as an investor sort of you know uh, easier as well got it yeah no it's uh, i can totally get it and it's really hard uh, to say no and over time you know you've uh, figured your framework i think it's very smart to ask that question you know either the founder himself or herself would be like please say no it's fine yeah. and uh, you know at least you're making them uh, you know think through and be methodical dhruv you've done about 50 uh, odd investments uh, maybe we can talk about you know few of your portfolio companies in a way where you know we can understand this is how dhruv functions yeah. Uh, what that means is few companies that you invested yeah. in. Uh, what was the thought process like? What were the stories behind sure. those investments? Sure. Um, so I think um, you know there's a couple of them I'm I'm exceptionally proud of, right? So um, one of course is a very recent one which you and I have done together, um, Apni Bus, right? Uh, so like you meet Sumit the first time, really unassuming guy. He's built a couple of. You know, he's been sort of in the owner-operator mindset, which I have been in in the past, right? Helping great founders build great companies as a, as as a good right-hand guy, you know, uh, in a key operator role. And then you step out to build a company, and you know, the first thing you could do is come up with a thesis and and build a product around it and try and sell a little bit of it and raise a small seed. And the guy says, "No, um, I'm going to." i'm going to move to a small town in rajasthan and i'm going to like take a kholi on rent and i'm going to now be a bus conductor for one month and i'm going to run intercity buses and i'm going to sell tickets and at that point in time there is no question you can pose to that person which would fundamentally like change your thesis on the fact that this guy will build something great right um i think the only challenge i have with him is i need to time and again sort of grab him by the collar and pull him up you know during our check ins and say are you thinking big picture take a step back are you thinking big picture um and cuz he gets into the weeds uh, continuously and I, and i think that's a natural evolution as you get to 0 to 1 1 to 10 that's there but for me that's you know one of my uh, most recent companies which I'm absolutely a big evangelist of. I love what the guy is building. Has zero correlation to my life. I'm never going to use those buses. I'm never going to travel in those places. But he's building for Bharat something that I've done, and I understand that what you and I live is not even an iota of the of some of the real world problems that people are experiencing. Um, and so there's there's this huge opportunity to what I call. you know we get out of that india mindset and build for bharat mindset um is is really where uh, what i feel this fits into so for me that build for bharat thesis is is definitely there right um um and i and, and that's what i love uh then there's another company that that i'm uh, you know that i did an investment about 2 years ago uh, it's been growing strength strength is basic home loans um you know india is one of those you know economies where people tell you that if you don't own your house you're not successful in life right? now the youngsters like you and me who will always and i like to call us young uh, who will always be renting and don't believe in you know um, locking away our our capital in this but again you and i have the comfort to know where our next rental check will come from but the people who are sort of in the you know the burgeoning middle class of india for them the aspirational is I lived in a two-bedroom house with my parents. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. Now I want to buy the next three-bedroom, and and I want to buy then then a four-bedroom, and maybe someday own a small plot and build a kothi and and or a bungalow and live there. Now that aspiration of middle India, um, to 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 sort of put away a significant part of their wealth to own this biggest asset class, does like if everyone wants it. what is the, what the what the financial services institution have done is they've made the process of applying for a home loan as difficult as it can be it is absolutely brutal on on like i have at one point owned a property and said i'm never going to do this ever again it's just brutal like 
from buying it to selling it to getting out of the the system is really bad um and the financing is the worst part of it because they make you feel unwelcome they make you feel like you don't deserve this that they're doing a, a favor on you um you know you're going beyond your means this company is now come out and said look we're going to just make it smooth we're going to make it fast we're going to make it efficient um we're going to cater to you know the banks also so we're not going to we're not they are not trying to become a new player in the market but it's at they're just rewriting all of the inefficiency out of the out of the operating code of of all the relationships um and because of that they're just growing strength on strength um the kind of revenue that they're doing the kind of numbers that they're doing um are absolutely phenomenal you have financial services institutions now reaching out to me people from you know my industry connects saying can you get us a a connect with atul and his team uh we want to get you know we want to list on their product we want them to distribute products for us um and you know you have every sort of you know mid mid size financial services powerhouse getting in there and saying you know if we could only buy these guys out uh we'd apply for a housing finance uh, uh you know license because this distribution is what we need this is what we need to build and then you have some really large companies uh you know like you know won't take names but one of india's largest um uh, offline dsas um is basically just saying hey how the hell are they able to do this because even we are finding hard to put technology into this industry and these guys are running on a pure tech 100% automated system so so i think uh again like if you just don't take no for an answer and you just say look i know this is a better way i'm going to i'm going to build such a competent and a unique competent and high quality high grade product that even my biggest detractors are going to start using my product um is is a mindset that hasn't hit the indian market in my opinion for a very long period of time we are still in that jugad mindset ki mvp now nikal jao mvp now nikal jao you know you know we are like we I, i we have companies with like you know million uh, you know mao and they are still running on their mvp product and saying oh sorry this is phase 1 and you're still not into phase 2 and iteration um and then you have this guy like atul who's sort of never worked in the valley but bringing that whole valley mindset of saying build an absolute finished product because you have one shot at the market and then just now scale so love love what he's built you know then it's all about approach execution and, and so you you keep those in mind but yeah there's some of the companies that you know i have a uh, you know i I'm, i'm exceptionally proud of you are super excited about yeah. i can see that yeah. from uh, like the energy can be seen through uh, <laughs> and through looks like you know your playbook is uh, finding founders that have strong founder market fit yeah. uh, the why is super strong massive market and unit economics yeah. like does it even make sense uh and yeah i i love uh, sumit and what is building at uh, apni bus uh, so when we first connected sumit and i you know i asked him we need to bring a few operator investors uh and i made few intros and then i met with him a couple of weeks back and typically i ask uh, you know what uh, you know who are the investors and how are they adding yeah. value because that helps me as well down the road when i am inviting uh, folks to the cap table and of course your name uh, you know popped up he talked about you uh, how you're helping uh, sumit through your experience at uh, bharat pay and that's also actually helping you as well where you know you i think at the end of the day uh, it really comes down to are you really adding value to founders in unique ways yeah. uh and that really helps you uh you know get into the best deals or even founders reaching out yeah. to you dro uh man we could actually go on and on yeah, you know i had few very interesting conversation uh, questions here but i would ask one which you know you've experienced it look you've created wealth through esops yeah. uh and i think it's an interesting topic uh these days i i, I read it yesterday uh i think about in the last 3 years 1.4 billion or 1.5 billion is what you know employees uh wealth created 
uh, in the last three years. So let's say, you know, you are a founder starting a company. How to think about structuring the ESOPs? So I look, I think uh, there is no bigger motivator than skin in the game, right? Uh, so that said, I think firstly, I think ESOPs are nothing more than a compensation because, you know, if you're a well-funded series A company also, or even a seed company, you've done a, let's say a half a million dollar check, you can afford to pay good, good salaries. How do you sort of ensure that you're not a stepping stone for people just saying, Hey, I'd want to come and get some zero to one experience and move on. So, you know, there's you use, what you do is you, you sort of show people the, the future of what the company is really going to look like and, where that wealth creation opportunity comes and why should people take the risk of coming and spending some of the best years of their life building this with you, right? Um, and and so I think the question, you know, a lot of people say, you know, ESOPs are very bastardized and I know of founders who've had bad experiences with, you know, maybe their policies weren't constructed well in the early days and, and so it has a sort of downstream effect. So I'll talk a little bit about policy in a second, but I think, the dip, there's a very small fraction of people who will say, no, no, don't give out ESOPs or, you know, you know, the risk goes away at CDC. So at that time change and only give ESOPs to leadership. I think that's, that's just really, you know, very random HR, uh, traditional HR influences coming into startups to get their digital chops and then bringing like random policies in. Um, what's a good policy for a startup? I'll, I'll comment about it in a second and, you know, uh, I'm proud of that Bharat Pay is one of the best ESOP policies in the, in, in the country today. Um, uh, how should founders think about it is I think the minute you do your first sort of, uh, you know, series, whatever, series zero, or you want to call it your, your first round, is you philosophically have wired your investors and everyone else saying this company's 10% of this company will always be owned by employees, right? So one is reservation of that pool. I think that conversation happens much later in the day. And then people are like, you dilute, I dilute. And you know, like it should just be very clear to founders and investors that this is not, neither, this was neither your share nor my share. This has always been the employee share. And this pool will always maintain like that. So I know a couple of really smart founders who've done that from day one. Just said like, boss, I created, when I created a company on day zero, when there's no product, nothing, it's 90, 10, I own 90% of the company, 10% will be owned by future employees. So that allocation is done and it continuously gets maintained through pro rata over a period of, as the subsequent rounds happen. So I think that practice has not become pervasive because people feel like if I get well-funded, I'll be able to give salary and I will not have to dilute myself and I'll have more for myself and more for the investors. I think it's a very short-sighted thinking, to be very honest. So I, that's not what I uh, subscribe to, right? Uh, the second thing that I that I uh, um, talk about on ESOPs is, I think there is a there is there are multipliers that you have to apply to a person's salary to make it competent for them. Now that is very individualistic. I know that in the early days of Bharat Pay, when we were hiring a bunch of CXOs, there was someone who we hired at, you know, one X of their comp and they were very happy about it. There was someone we hired at five X and they were very unhappy about it. Right. Um, and so I think you have to measure a person's capability and risk appetite and award it accordingly. So if you have a high capable, highly capable person with a low risk appetite, right? You may be able to sort of play off with, let's say you, that person will ask you for a higher, you know, salary, and you may actually reserve ESOPs to give it to some other employee who has a higher, who has maybe equally capable, but a higher risk appetite saying, Achha, aap mere ko salary 25% kam de do, but compensate me in ESOPs. Now that each person is betting on it. One guy is betting on saying that I, I, for me, mental peace is more important for the other person. They're saying, look, I'm okay. I can live in less, but I believe in the company to do well. And you know what? Interestingly, I've seen like, you know, quite a few friends from like Flipkart, for example, 
who worked there for eight, 10 years, who today have like a seven X difference in their wealth. Started at the same time, doing the same job. Uh, virtually, you know, over a time as the company became big, their comps also got corrected. They were, you know, brought into the same, like they could be twins for all you know, right? But one of them is seven times wealthier than the other. Because that person took that bet early on. So, so again, you have to give employees that flexibility, but, you know, you have to create that framework. Uh, I think a good ESOP policy uh, in India, uh, and I've, you know, amalgamated this by speaking to a bunch of founders across uh, uh, the ecosystem is a four year even investing. So people do like, uh, like hockey tailed investing or people do like that you have to spend two years in a company and your cliff is two years. And there's a bunch of stuff like that, which you're hearing in the market. I think it's just over optimization by founders, um, to compensate for other shortcomings, either the shortcomings in the model or themselves or whatever is a evenly spread four year grant, one year cliff, either a monthly or a quarterly vesting. Uh, why? Because you will most often than not see people who have decided to leave a company will just sort of coast for five, six months to get their next cliff before they go out. You don't want that kind of toxicity. That kind of toxicity is not worth it. Just give them half the shares and say, Jana hai to jao bhai. Like, we don't want this in the system. Um, you know, we, we also, five years, the day you leave, you have five years. So Bharat based policies, you have five years um, uh, to exercise your ESOPs uh, from the day of your resignation. Um, and, and I think a lot of this uh, gives transparency, visibility, comfort to people to take risky bets and, and back, uh, back risky horses. So I think, uh, these are some of the things that you should talk about, right? Um, should you have a, like people don't know what tangibility of an ESOP looks like. So we have something called an ESOP cash curve policy. What basically we do is we mandatorily redeem the first ESOP that vests to you. It's like a post edit check to you. You can get it back if you want. So at least you believe that what I have is worth some money. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and so this, there are some, there are some really good practices that are being implemented in the company. Uh, for example, I won't take the name, but there's a very large FinTech in India, which, you know, whose founder makes sure that before any of their sort of key leaders get it, anyone in the company who wants to surrender a certain percentage of their ESOPs, um, gets liquidity in any round first, right? For them, like he, he makes sure that they, that they, that they think of it like currency, right? And I really respect that about, about them, uh, that, that you worked hard. This is yours. Uh, before I solve for myself, I'll solve for you. Um, right. Um, and we've done the same thing in Bharat Pay as well during our series. T series E, uh, a lot of our early employees have actually, you know, there are people who've bought homes. There are people who've gone abroad for the first time. There are people who've bought a car in their family for their, you know, parents for the first time. Um, and we've seen some of these stories come true. And, and I think it's a very powerful tool, uh, to motivate people if, if dealt to the right way, it can also be, uh, it can also feel like an albatross in your neck if you don't build it the right way. Um, yeah. and actually demotivate people. So, so yeah. Think yeah. Like yeah, no, I think, uh, <clears throat> as you just said, it, it is very, very important, uh, to have it in the company, uh, to you know, motivate and retain. Uh, and I'm hoping through maybe at some point you create a uh, sort of like a framework and put it out there. Cause there's a lot of founder. In fact, uh, Smith and I, we had a chat around, yeah. uh, building the ESO policy yeah. and, uh, with this, uh, Dhruv, we'll transition into our, you know, last section. Uh, Alfonso is, uh, is coming in and uh, he's asking, Dhruv, what's something, man, that you've been wanting to learn, uh, but you haven't got the time yet to do it? Uh, very interesting. Um, so I, I think, you know, without saying a specific skill set, I'll actually say there's a you know, I have this sort of, you know, you have this Porter's five forces, right? So you, 
I'm an ex consultant. Sorry, I put everything in frameworks. I have a I have something called I call the four P's of life, right? Uh, personal, professional, parent, and partner. Um, I need to excel in those four P's. Um, every day I need to get up and be better than I was yesterday in that. Um, and I think where I lack, unfortunately, is is balance. And I want to learn balance, right? So. Um, more often than not my health or my physical well-being and you know we've discussed this for a while right is is something which will take a back seat if i'm temporarily extremely overwhelmed with saying oh i've got you know stuff to do with the kids and then i've got to like do paperwork and i've got to do meetings and stuff um no i'll start working out from next week no, you know then the p the personal takes a back seat somehow i feel like none of the four can come out of your mindset so so I think I have identified one area in each where I want to excel. So I think I I definitely want to go back to being, you know, an, a more active partner with my wife and spending more time with her traveling. We used to travel a lot. We've done like, I think, 37 countries uh, in, in our sort of 13 years of marriage. And we want to sort of increase that number. Um, and, you know, we're limited by where we can go with the kids or without the kids. So, you know, what they will enjoy, what they won't enjoy. But so I think just finding personal pockets of personal private time with my partner, uh, because we both are busy professionals, is is there. Uh, with my children, I think I want to be able to spend, um, you know, uh, actually spend more time with them doing activities. And I think, you know, there's a lot of passive parenting that comes in because you can give an iPad, you can give a TV and just sort of be like, hey, but I'm around, but I'm not really there. So that's there. On the on the personal front, uh, you know, I, fitness is, as you know, fitness has been my goal for me this year. Um, you know, I've uh, managed to bring my weight down. Uh, I'm eating healthier. I think it's going to continue to be my goal for the next two years on a personal front. It's just focus on my fitness and get become fitter than what I was. Um, and I think, uh, you know, professionally, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, God willing, uh, there's a few things in development, which, you know, hopefully I'll be able to share soon, but I think I want to reach a point where I'm able to sort of pick up what I'm most passionate about and make that sort of my vocation. Um, uh, uh, right. Uh, and I think, uh, you have to get to a certain point in life where you have that power to command saying passion becomes vocation, uh, which I don't think has happened today, but maybe in the next year or so that should happen. Uh, but yeah, so, so for anything in life when I do, I say like, yeah, I need to work on all four of these at the same time. Cause if I don't, yeah. then, then that's a challenge. Yeah. No, love the framework of four P's. I'll take inspiration from that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what's the kindest thing someone has done to you? Um, uh, for me, the kindest thing I have ever in life experienced, and that's sort of something that I strive to pay it forward is I got really good mentors and people who had no reason, absolutely would get no benefit from a 23, 24 year old, random, like headstrong, aggressive Punjabi boy, um, to mold him and guide him uh, and you know uh, you know I can rattle off these people's names you know like Bhavdeep Singh, Daljeet Singh, you know Raj Gore, Amit Varma, uh, Karan Singh at Bain, you know uh, Vijay, people who took out time to just say we think you can do this, here's you can what you can do better, Parshan lag rahe, what you're looking troubled. What's the problem? Tell me. I may not be able to solve it, but at least I'll be able to listen to you. Um, and I think more often than not, just listening, guiding, counseling me uh, at their own cost. Um, there's nothing more powerful than that. There is absolutely nothing more powerful than that. Um, you know, uh, it. You know, in the olden days, uh, you know, a king used to have courtiers who were the smartest of the people in the world who would stand and and tell a young king 
what they could do better in a very respectful way so that you could be a better king, you could be a better regent. Uh, no, you're not a, I'm not a king, but like, I, I don't, never had access to that. But I, I, I think just, I got really lucky with, the, well, that's what happened. So now what I've decided in my life, and I've been doing this actively, I, this is something that I pursue actively is, if someone comes to me for advice, that's the one place I never say no. I never say no. So if someone says, hey, I need five minutes of your time, um, and it could be like, God, the stupidest questions I've, I've sometimes experienced, right? Um, I will never let that person experience that. I, I will I'll be like, that's fine. I, you know, I'll tell you, frankly, I have so much time, but I will help you to the best of my ability. I will never say no. Um, and, I, and I think somewhere um, a lot of that karma sort of comes back to you, right? So, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the yeah, best yeah, thing yeah. anyone's ever done to me. I think it's very important. Uh, in fact, Mithain uh, Sampath, he talked about it recently where, you know, one of the best things or uh, I would say the core of Silicon Valley's culture is where people help other people uh, with nothing, uh, yeah. you know, uh, anything in mind. Like they, they're not looking to some get something back from yeah. that. Uh, and and he's and Dhruv, I don't think it's uh, one you're just, you're, of, he's one of the promoters of that culture in India, right? You pick up the phone and call him. The guy would be like, Haan bol. and we'll be like, uh, ek problem thi. Haan bol, bata. and then he'll solve it for you. Like, like, why? Like, why? Why do you need to do it? You're running like a six billion dollar company. Like, why? They, why do you need to like get involved in someone's like, you know, basar? You don't need to. And like, the guy will do it. Um, and and you know, you will feel ashamed that you don't like you in your sort of smaller ecosystem. Don't do that. And like. And I think it's it's a really powerful tool. Like, just get up and help someone for for no ultimate motive. Like, ah, fantastic. Okay, great. Your problem solved. Go for it. Trust me, that person will get up and go and solve someone else's problem because there is no other way that you can feel proud of yourself, saying that I just got helped by someone for no rhyme or reason, for no personal interest. And if I cannot, and that person, it, it didn't cost that person anything. If I can't do that same thing for someone else, uh, you know, do I really deserve to be called a good person? Yeah. I just think it's such a powerful tool. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, uh, when I had moved back uh, from US to India, the first guy actually uh, I spoke with, and it was a cold email I sent to Mithain, right. and he quickly uh, jumped on a call and, uh, and, you know, helped me think through, uh, you know, my career in India and Dhruv, you know, and for you, I think, I, I don't think you've been lucky. I'm sure there are a few traits, uh, that you have, which attracts a lot of these people and they're open to help you and with this Dhruv, uh, man, thank you so much, uh, with you. It's always fun. Uh, you know, having a conversation it's it's uh, it feels very you know free flowing and natural and uh, and that's how i guess uh, you are as a person thank thanks for doing no, it no thank you man Lo love this love your series love watching it so um you know hopefully uh, you know the next time we catch up on this conversation again um uh, you know we would have between that we would have had a bunch of uh, uh, prawn curries at comorin uh, <laughs> off the menu <laughs> love it <laughs> but, but we'll catch up soon we'll catch up in person soon but thank you for inviting me to do this uh, loved it um, and always available to help so if anyone's listening uh, feel free to sort of just ping me on social media I'm, I'm extremely responsive always happy to help uh, you know uh, just promise me you'll pay it forward uh. yeah and, and go to or, or go to uh, uh, Cafe Reed yeah. uh, you might see it through there <laughs>